Are you working on your author career, but struggling to get that first book published? Does the goal of being an author seem too lofty? Or are thoughts of having multiple books and making a full-time living are as fantastical as living in Cinderella's castle? Welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where aspiring authors can be heard. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have gotten their foot on the author career path. Hear what they've done to get there and where they want to go now. Settle back. It's time for a bit of inspiration and advice. Come listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. All right. Well, Kevin, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for taking some time to talk to me today. Well, thank you for having me. Great. Um, so we want to talk about your book first for all the readers out there. Uh, but before we talk about that, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from and maybe a little bit about your background and what you like to do besides writing? Sure. I, my name is Kevin Fellows. Uh, I live in the desert Southwest. I also lived in upstate New York for a while. I, and I was oh, born and raised in New Hampshire. Oh, okay. Um, as for what I like to do, um, I like to read. That's probably my number one thing to do these days. That's not writing. Um, and I cook, uh, spend time with my daughters, uh, struggle a little bit to teach myself guitar. And, um, I try to exercise with running and biking. Nice. How long you been trying to play guitar? Oh, God, years. <laughs> um, I was I played bass in a band way back uh, in the eighties, um, and um, switched to acoustic guitar probably a decade ago, just for my own purposes. Okay, I I, I sound the same. I played bass for rock band group uh, back in the eighties, friends. And, uh, I've always had trouble trying to play guitar. Try, I don't know. The, the strings are too close. Uh, it's, yeah, it's too hard to switch between the chords for me. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's those extra two strings. That's, it's just too much. <laughs> yeah. Can't, my brain can't handle it. Yep. Same. It, what have you been cooking? Anything good lately? Um, one of my daughters uh, really likes Korean food, so I've been doing some various types of Korean rice and meat dishes. Ah, does she like kimchi? Actually, she does not. I do, but she doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it's not exactly something everybody likes. Right. Um. All right, so why did you – so obviously you're not – uh, like right out of high school or anything right now, why did you decide to start writing? Well, I've been writing actually since I was in high school. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that got me started was probably a Steinbeck and Hemingway English class. <laughs> and I was really bored during the Hemingway semester. <laughs> and I, as any 17 year old arrogant boy, <laughs> I just thought I could do better. So I started writing a novel in class. It was called um, The Meaning of Life. Uh, <laughs> nothing, again, no nothing. arrogance at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but then, you know, I got more serious about it as I got a little older. And in my late 20s, early 30s, I was submitting short stories to the magazine market. And back then that was, you know, send us printed manuscript with self-addressed stamped envelope and get right. responses. And I eventually got to the point where I was getting some, um, you know, personalized responses, uh, still rejections, but they were personalized. So I thought I was climbing the ladder. And um, that, that is, that's better than a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then life kind of intervened, you know, marriage, kids, um, uh, things of that nature and finishing school at night, um, building a career to support that family. So, uh, I was still writing on weekends and mostly writing, you know, longer epic style fantasies and, um, 
not really focusing much on craft, just writing because I enjoyed writing. Uh, but always had in the back of my mind that I would be publishing at some point. Um, what pushed me over the edge probably was um, four years ago this month, I had a heart attack. Oh. And yeah, uh, at that point, I realized all those stories that I thought I was going to write someday might, there might not be a someday. <laughs> right. So I really got serious about craft and figuring out how to do this whole writing thing. And I spent about five years, uh, really five years focused on that, four years of it since the, the heart attack. And I attended some workshops and um, went to some uh, conferences and, uh, like I said, just really focused on how do you write a novel or a short story and um, tried to get a lot better at it. Um, and, and I think that's pretty interesting how a lot of people talk about that, you know, a, a near death experience, uh, something happens, changes their lives with their health and they realize, Hey, what do I really want to do? What, you know, if I only have yeah. days and, you know, you pretty much were pushed into awakening to what you really wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And I had just had kind of a vague idea that it was kind of after my career, I worked in technology for years and I, <laughs> I felt like after my career was over, then I could uh, focus on writing. But again, the, the heart attack really made me think that, you know, I shouldn't wait. I should just be doing what I want to do now. Right. <clears throat> and I, I also find that interesting because there's a very large number of new authors I talk to that are coming from computer tech backgrounds and also play music. Uh, it's like, sometimes it seems like a very uh, common thing. Uh, you know, do you like computers? Do you play music? Well, you could be an author, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, I find it interesting that while the music part I get, that's creative. Um, even just playing it is, there's something creative about it. And I, I listened to your interview with uh, Nosa and how he does mechanical engineering with, right. and sees that as a creative um, energy. I found that what I was doing in technology was just a drain. It was not – the only impetus it had for writing was, hey, stop doing this and go write. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh, I know a lot of people do development, computer coding, programming, because it, it is creative. It kind of tickles yeah. that same part of the brain. But what happens is as you do it and as you get better and you do it longer, you end up moving into management and in areas that aren't as much fun. That's right. <laughs> so it That's takes right. away from that. Yeah, I I eventually got to management as well. Um, although, and, and the, I think the other part of that was that added to stress, which certainly contributed to the heart attack. So I'm sure <laughs> that was something that I, I knew I should stop doing and I should really just focus on the creative uh, work of, of writing stories. Great. So the story you've been working on, tell us about uh, the book you've been working on. Uh, sure. You have. I started writing, well, I've been doing na uh, national novel writing month in November for many years. And I decided in 2018 to do something a little different and not write a novel, but I was going to write short stories all month. Um, that was kind of an effort to f get better at writing sh short stories and to just produce a lot so that I would have some stories to edit afterwards. I found a, an idea for a world in which I could set several of those stories. And I wrote, I think, 12 stories for that nano and four of them were set in this world. And the world is a, a it's a city that's a medieval city, but it's moving through time and place. And it lands in these different times and places and people wander into it. Unfortunately, the city then moves on 
and the people who are in the city find that they can't get back to their own time and place. Nice. So do you consider what you're writing fantasy or science fiction? Yeah, that's an interesting (laughs) dilemma. Um, This book, I feel, is firmly fantasy because it deals a lot with magic. And the the time travel element, you could argue, is maybe some sort of natural phenomena uh, that could possibly be explained by science. But I don't try to explain it, and the characters don't either. They Well, a couple of them do, but the most of them don't. And, you know, they're just trying to survive and trying to figure out if staying is the best thing or if leaving for some other time and place is a better option. Okay. So so I ask, because I've talked to a lot of authors, um, and it seems like the categories we've kind of grown up with are are really getting gray and fuzzy around the edges. Um, my, my, I mean, obviously the best example I always have is star Wars where George Lucas thinks of it as a fantasy. And, you know, when it's viewed like that, it's definitely different than sci-fi. Um, is this the type of book you've always written or, or, no, nope. write all sorts. Okay. <laughs> no, like I said, I, I was writing kind of a lot more what you would consider epic fantasy, maybe even a, a one or two dark fantasy type things. Um, this, like I said, came about as just trying to push myself to write some short stories. And when I sent my stories that I thought was going to be a collection, I added two more, so there were six. I thought they were going to be a collection that I could have published while I was um, trying to finish a novel. And I sent the collection to um, Kat Howard, who's a science fiction writer, fantasy writer, and um, editor. And she looked at it. And while she was looking at it, I started to think maybe that should be a novel. And her feedback was basically that she wanted more and she thought it should also be a novel. (laughs) So I decided that with that advice and my own realization, I should turn it into a novel. And so I spent the rest of 2019 um, shaping it more into a novel. Okay. And I like that approach. I think that's interesting because I've written – a story that started off as a bunch of short story adventures that I'm adjusting into a, more of a, a collected stories that form a cohesive one cohesive story, you know, so it's kind of novel like, and that's not an original idea. Actually, I found there's been some more famous popular authors that have done that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the books that we think of as classics were serialized first in right. newspapers and magazines. Right. So do you think that approach helped you uh, get the the thing done and want to get it published? Because you said you've been writing for years. So obviously you have some material you could have used or worked with. Uh, do you think doing it, this approach helped you get to publishing? I, um, yeah, I knew I needed a, a backlist of some kind. And so, like I said, I thought it would be a collection of short stories and that would just be a way to get something out fairly quickly. Um, but then when it became a novel, I still wanted to try to get it out as quickly as I could to then start working on the next thing. And, um, it really did kind of provide me a focus. One, it was very different than what I was doing. It was a bit challenging because the structure again was a more serial type type structure, not like, um, your typical three act four part, um, you know, hero's journey kind of thing. It was right. it was very different than that. And that was challenging just to kind of learn how other people had done those kinds of novels. And um, there was a lot of energy. And um, the other thing that happened was in 2019, um, I lost that IT job that I'd had for many years. Um, so I was laid off and I had the time. And I said, this is perfect. Um, I've, I've got the time. I've got enough money to, to 
tide me over for a few months and I'm going to push. I'm going to try to finish this book and get it out. Nice. And it seems like uh, the last couple of years uh, with all the changes, a lot of people have gotten uh, that, that like push and that, Hey, I don't have uh, forever and have really wanted to get some writing done. I think that's great that we can do that. I, so I'm assuming this is uh, self-published, right? Well, it is technically, but one of the things that I was doing as I was trying to make that transition from IT to some other career was to um, go into publishing. And so I've started a small press. Okay. Um, the the press is called um, Modern Folklore Press, and it's going to be publishing mostly science fiction and fantasy, speculative fiction. And um, it will eventually publish other people, but right now it's only publishing me. So technically it's self-published. Yes. Okay. Uh, and have you gotten any feedback from people on the book yet? Yes. Um, uh, I've talked to a few people. Uh, these days we're not talking directly with a lot of people, but I've talked to a few who have read it and they enjoyed it. And that was um, nice to hear. Um, my Goodreads and Amazon ratings are at four. I don't have a lot of either, but they are at nice. four stars, which feels good. I know there's some one stars coming and I'll have to deal with that. But uh, um, right now it's been pretty good. And then um, I did submit this, the novel for a professional review, which I have to say that is a more nerve wracking process than sending it off to an editor. Um, Cause you don't know what they're going to say. They might find something really terrible about it. And then it's going to be published as a review and there's nothing you can do. It's out of your hands. Right. Um, but I was fortunate. I got a four star review and uh, the text of the review was really positive, very warm and I think the reviewer really got the novel and what nice. I was trying to say. Good. So uh, where did you get that reviewed? Um, that was through Reezy's Discovery Service. Discovery. Okay. Yep. Um, and uh, where can we get the book? Is it, I assume on Amazon, but did you go wide or are you staying with Amazon right now? Yeah. Again, because I'm running a small press, I'm taking the long view and – working a bit more like a traditional publisher. So yes, it is available wide, any bookstore, anywhere. In fact, I, I did a few BookBub ads and they sent me a note saying my ads weren't working. And the reason they did that was because they're very focused on eBooks and those ads did not have any clicks to any of the eBook stores, but they had a lot of clicks to IndieBound and um, um, what's the other uh, book bookshop.org and bookshop.uk. So I knew that people were buying the paperback and they were buying it from independent bookstores. <laughs> Interesting. So why do you think that was? Well, I kind of think that's partly because the book is a different type of fantasy. It appeals to people who read widely across multiple genres, and they're not really focused on finding, you know, as many eBooks of the same kind of thing as they can find. They're more interested in what I consider the, just the, the luxurious aspect of sitting down with a good book and, and reading it. And, um, obviously they're readers who support their local bookstores. Nice. That's, that's probably a good demographic to target if, uh, that's who you think they are. Cause that's how I read. And I know I've gotten to discussions with other authors that they, they like, well, if you write fantasy, you have to write every book fantasy and stay fantasy. And, and I'm right. like, but I don't read that way. And a lot of my friends don't. So it's good to hear somebody else with kind of the same 
thoughts and running into the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I did a little bit of uh, very informal, very unscientific research into how people figure out what book they want to read next. And I, I think I asked about 20 people some questions about this. And obviously, the number one way that people hear about new books is word of mouth. And that's always been the case. It doesn't matter whether it's traditional or indie published. That's just always the case. But I went a little deeper and I asked them, what does word of mouth mean? Does it mean through a Facebook group or Reddit or, you know, how do you find it, out these things? And the number one way that people communicate that they love a book is they text their friends. And of course, there's no way to really market to texts, <laughs> at least not yet. Um, but it did kind of confirm what I thought was spending a lot of money on ads through Facebook or, um, you, you know, something like that probably wasn't going to make sense because that's not where people were hearing about the books they wanted to read. They were hearing it from their friends and family. And they were hearing about it, not necessarily face to face, but through through texting. Oh well, that's interesting. Uh, I'm going to have to think about that and ask some others about that and uh, see how. Yeah. Again, my sample size was pretty small, <laughs> but <laughs> but still, uh, that's I think uh, what we all need to do is figure out how to get a hold of the people who like your book, and that's. I mean, at least you did a little, and that's something to pursue. That's definitely an area people haven't used a lot of, obviously. Right. And I think it does go back to, you know, knowing your your readers. Um, and when you're first starting out, that's really hard because how do I know who likes my book? Because nobody's seen my book, right? Right. Um, it, it's something you learn over time and you do have to try different things. I mean, yes, I'm trying advertising through Amazon and, and BookBub and trying to figure out what that means for me and the type of things that I write um, and the specific book that I have out right now. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to take some work. Yeah. So this book you have out right now, is it, what was the name of the book again? I'm sorry. You know, I was just thinking we, we haven't actually mentioned that. <laughs> it is um, called At the End of the World. The city in the book's called At the End of the World, or, or The End of the World is the name of the city. And so it's um, At the End of the World, and there's a short story a uh, reader magnet that I did called A Map at the End of the World. And I've actually written a book of poems that I'm going to bundle together with the short story um, that's called Poems from the End of the World. Oh, nice. Okay. And I'd, I'd love to hear if you think the reader magnet helps. Uh, are you planning on doing a second book following this, a sequel? No, this pretty much is a standalone, which again is making it more difficult to market because um, I think there is some traction for um, people across all genres who like to see at least two books um, if they really love the characters. But the way the plot turned out, the way the characters made their decisions, I don't really, I would have to introduce an entirely new cast of characters to do a second book. And so I won't say never, but it's not in my current plans. Got it. Okay. Um, so for you, uh, growing up writing, uh, I assume and you said you like to read a lot. So what are some of your favorite authors and favorite books? Yeah, I read widely. Um, I lead a, read literary fiction, science fiction, history, nonfiction, um, just kind of across the board. I used to read a lot of horror when I was much younger. Um, so I'm going to focus on kind of the more recent current um, books that I, or 
re, uh, sorry, authors that I'm f- kind of following. Um, I think Sophia Samatar is probably one of our best fantasy writers. Uh, she has a short story collection called Tender, um, published by Small Beer Press. That is a just a, a wonderful book, and I go back to it again and again for inspiration. Um, Arcady Martin's um, Memory of Empire. I thought that was one of the best science fiction things I've read in recent years. Um, well, when I was younger, Tim Powers, you know, Anubis Gates and those kind mm. of books were a big influence on me. Um, also, Ursula K. Le Guin, both her fantasy and her poetry. Uh, David Mitchell, who wrote Cloud Atlas and the Bone Clocks. Um, and I was able to actually meet David and, uh, we talked for like five minutes <laughs> about nice. crap. Um, he's a really nice guy <clears throat> and I really, uh, enjoyed the, both his books and his conversation. Um, NK Jemison, Mary Robinette Kowal, Guy Gabriel K. Those are all people that I really enjoy reading a lot. Uh, I've also met Rob, Mary Robinette, um, and she's amazing. Um, very recently, uh, I read a book called Mem by Bethany C. Morrow, uh, which was, it's a very short book, um, but it's a really interesting kind of a what if um, speculative fiction, but full of a very emotional um, impact. And I, I really found that to be very entertaining. And, um, from a writer's perspective, uh, I learned a lot from it. Um, and then probably the last one I I will mention was Amanda Hackwith, who wrote the unwritten library, um, which is kind of a wild and crazy book and right up my alley. (laughs) <laughs> I'll have to put some links to some of those uh, for anyone that's looking for similar books. Um, also, down where you live, um, do you have a favorite local bookstore? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, <laughs> obviously, nobody's spending time inside bookstores these days. Um, there's one that is in downtown Las Vegas called the writer's block. It's not easy for me to get to, so I don't go there, but I have ordered online from there. However, um, as I mentioned, I grew up in New Hampshire and every time I go back to New Hampshire, I stop in at Gibson's bookstore in Concord. And I love that bookstore. Nice. Okay. I like the, put links to bookstores uh, for people going around. All right. Well, David, uh, I appreciate you having taken some time to talk to me about your book before we finish this section of the uh, podcast up. Why, what would you tell people on why they should get your book and read your book? Um, Because I think it is different. It is a fantasy. So you can kind of escape to it. It's got a little bit of um, alternate history and some contemporary characters as well. Um, And I don't know, I I love books with an ensemble cast. So if you like um, an ensemble grouping, then I think this book would be for you. Sure, there's world building, there's some magic, but the the focus really is on the characters and their relationship between each other. Uh, and Kevin, uh, where can we find your book and find you online? Uh, as I mentioned, the book is anywhere, any store, Kobo, Apple, Amazon, your local bookstore, even the library. Um, I managed to get my local public library to to order it, and and nice. and I borrowed it. <clears throat> so. <laughs> I, I would suggest that anybody wants to do that, they can. Um, uh, I'm easy to find online, um, just kevinjfellows.com. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, uh, both as at Kevin J. Fellows. Um, I do have a Facebook, but I don't 
do a lot there. It's also Kevin J. Fellows. Um, but uh, Twitter and um, Instagram are where I spend most of my social, social media time. Uh, but KevinJFellows.com is probably the most direct and easy way to find me. Great. Well, great. Thank you. And I appreciate hearing about your book. I hope some people find it interesting. Uh, and thanks for taking some time to talk to us about it today. Oh, I loved it. It's great. Thank you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.